Well, hello, uh, I'm Mark Britz. I am guest hosting um, Guy Wallace's uh, chat with authors today. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Guy just recently interviewed me for his series and we decided to flip the tables because he has an exciting book himself that's in production that we're gonna talk about today. That book is performance-based lesson mapping and instructional development using a facilitated group process. So Guy, one, thank you for letting me, uh, you know, turn the tables on you a little bit, put you in the hot seat today. And, um, but let's get into it. I think everybody you know, who's, who knows you is great, but there's going to be people who don't know you. So one, thanks for agreeing to do this and, and letting me grill you for a little bit here. And um, tell us a little bit, uh, a bit about yourself, you know, what you do, your background, and then we'll get into the book. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and, and thank you for flipping the tables here on me and asking me to do this. It's, My pleasure. It's interesting. Uh, so I've been in the ISD, Instructional Systems Design business since 1979. I have a radio TV film degree. I entered in a training organization that I, you know, I'd worked part-time at, at, at college for this organization and then went halfway across the country to uh, their headquarters in Saginaw, Michigan and joined them where I learned uh, of the work of Tom Gilbert, Gary Rumler, Bob Mager, and mm -hmm. Jim Carlos, old guys from Mule Day. Now they're no longer with us, any of them, but uh, they were very instrumental in my development because the people that I went to work for had worked with these folks and understood their methodologies. And so I was very, very lucky in doing that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I worked at Witch Lumber for a while that I just spent uh, almost two years at Motorola where I got a chance to work with Gary Rumler on my projects, which meant I carried his pencils around as we went from client site to client site on project to project. And uh, I left them uh, in 1982 and joined a small consulting firm and I became the uh, uh, training guy. That was my part of the practice. Then my two business partners um, did other things related to strategic planning for training and development. And the guy that owned the company was a Bell Labs engineer. And we worked for a lot of technical organization, Fortune 10, 20, 50 companies. Um, and so I've been, I, my thing has been curriculum architecture design, performance-based curriculum architecture design, which produces a training and development path, later known as a learning path or maybe a development journey now. There's lots of names for these things over the decades. And I've done 76 of those kinds of projects for my clients to this point. It's all based on a performance model. What is the job? What are the outputs? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks? Uh, who's involved? What are the gaps in current state performance? Um, what content does the client already have? And then you put together a development path that's you know, as rigorous as necessary uh, and as flexible as you can make it uh, so that planning can occur, so that you've got a suggested path and a sequence and people down select from that and resequence it to meet their needs and get things if it's not part of their job. Because what I've learned over the years is that if somebody's got a job title similar to 1,100 other people, it might not mean that they're all doing the exact same thing. They may do very different things. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's a core to it, maybe not. So there's got to be a lot of flexibility in how you do these kinds of things. Um, and so I've, I've been doing that since 1982, and uh, I'm kind of semi-retired now. Uh, but that's my story, and I'm sticking. Very good. No, it's a rich and, and detailed one, and like you said, you've rubbed elbows with some big names. Um, and, and carrying that torch is is great. And I, I know for people who follow you on Twitter and other locations um, on the net, um, you're always bringing that wisdom out. So uh, one, I appreciate. I appreciate. It. I'm sure the audience right. does too. Uh, but you know, let's let's shift our focus, as you would say, uh, and talk a little bit more about your book. This uh, performance based lesson mapping and instructional development using a facilitated group process. So three-part question, which I love how you do this. So you're getting the same three-part question as everybody else. Who did you write it for? Yeah, yeah. Why did you write it? And what do you hope the takeaways are for the readers? I wrote this primarily for instructional designers or people who do analysis, design, and development. Mm -hmm. I also wrote it for uh, L&D leadership um, so that they can see that there's a way to actually facilitate design. That's one of the lack things that I've seen lacking in the field for a long time is that we talk about analysis, we seldom do it. We talk about design, we seldom do it. 
we usually jump right into development and say we're doing uh, analysis and design while we're doing development. And maybe that's true, maybe that's not. So I had developed a very mechanized way to do design. And so I wanted to share that with leaders so that they might say, well, we, our staff should be doing something along these lines. Um, and what was the third part of the question there? I, well, uh, I hope people will get from it. So yeah. um, I believe that you adopt what you can and adapt the rest. And that's what I've done throughout my career is that I've, I've been witness to, got a chance to work with some of the thought leaders from back in the day, back in the 80s and the 90s. And so I stole all of their good ideas and Absolutely. techniques and adapted most of it. Mm -hmm. adopted a fair amount too. So it's, I, I don't know, I have to think about that. But so I, I have embraced a lot of things that I've learned from others. And then I adapted them. I adapt the language, I adapt the formats and such, um, and created and made it fit with how I generally approach things as I extended my practice um, and tried to take all the good things. So a lot of the things that I do didn't come just from the instructional design or instructional development world. Yeah. From the total quality management world, because mm -hmm. when I was at Motorola, I, I really learned a lot about you know, some of the things at a very high level of what Deming was doing and Duran was doing and uh, some of the other quality leaders. Um, I was involved in developing some of Motorola's first training on quality for manufacturing supervisors and such. So I got mm -hmm. a little taste of everything, learned a little bit, you know, master of none. And I had already known about the quality movement from back in my college days in Rick Slumber. So I took a lot of things from a lot of different sources and kind of made it my own. And I'm hoping that if I share this in some level of detail, people can decide, oh, I like that. I can just use that as is. And oh, there's this other thing. Hmm, if I modify that, that'll probably work for me. And so that's what I want them to do. Not adopt everything that I've got and share but adapt it because I think that's the only way it's actually going to work for people is if they do that adaptation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like how you talk about that because I, you know, I did the same when I wrote social by design with James uh, you know, people have to contextualize it. Every situation, every company is unique as a fingerprint. We like to say, so, you know, what you pull in and take, you have to modify. And sadly, I don't think enough people are thinking that way. They're trying to just plug and play and it fails. Yeah, and, and, it's true when you're a consultant or when you're in a company, you're going to make adaptations on each and every project, mm -hmm. each and every effort. Nothing is just pure plug and play it in the next effort. No, you're going to make some adaptation. And so getting smart about what, what are the things that are likely needing to be adapted is, is really key. And, yeah. you know, when you write something or you, you present on it, it's kind of, you know, you don't have time to talk about all the variations um, and so it looks like, okay, that's very rigorous. We, we can't do it just like that. Well, no, you can't ever really. I, I, every project I've ever done for clients, you know, hundreds of them have had some level of adaptation borrowing mm -hmm. client mm -hmm. language when they didn't like my language, but I have to have some place to start. So I call it this, what do you want to call it? And so you make those kinds of ad adaptations for the client. So let's get into the book a little bit more. Um, you know, I've had a chance to look over it. I'm the lucky one, right? I get a chance to look at a manuscript. <laughs> uh, it is seven sections, 14 chapters. Uh, we could, you know, what I'd like to do is take this time for you to kind of, kind of present, you know, walk us through the flow, right? Tell, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the structure of the book uh, and kind of highlighting the general ideas as you move the reader through what they'll experience uh, with the book. Sure. Well, I started off this book different than most of my other books. It's, you know, I didn't want this one to be kind of like the murder mystery where you have to, you know, if you want to figure out did the butler do it or the maid do it, you turn to the very last chapter and aha, there it is. Mm -hmm. So this first chapter is if you had to do lesson mapping, uh, whether you're doing it with a facilitated group process or not, and your whole thing is to develop instruction or learning experiences or job aids or whatever, mm -hmm. how would you just use this methodology and the formats and the kinds of questioning and data that I go after. How would you use that if you were you know, head to the gun, a gun to the head, and you got to get it done right now? So I put that as the first chapter, kind of, you know, cutting to the chase. Here's what the bottom line thing is. Can you do this? Then the, then the succeeding uh, sections of the book uh, go after project planning, because I think that that's really key 
if you have really high stakes performance, high risk, high reward, you can't do this kind of in a quick and dirty fashion and hope, you know, and put out a minimally viable product because it may not be accurate, complete, and appropriate enough. And there could be huge issues and downsides for your organization and for the people that you've, you know, have taught. Maybe they harm themselves. So not everything can be done in that kind of a quick setting and uh, with a fast sprint to the end and boom, you're done and you hand it off and everybody's happy. So when you're doing project planning, my goal is to get the right people in the room to do mm-hmm. things at the right time. So project planning is that there's an int- chapter on intake. How do I work with the clients, the customers, the prospects who are making the request? How do then I formulate a project plan is the next chapter. And then how do I do a review, a more or less formal review that could be done informally as well. But how do you do a formal review with a project steering team of the client, and all the key stakeholders? Because what I want to do is I want to manipulate them to give me all the right people, people that you would cry and scream about, hey, I can't afford to have them away from the job doing this. Well, that's exactly who I want. That's who you want. Um, I want the top master performers. I want the top. I want other subject matter experts. Maybe I need somebody from the law department or from regulatory affairs in this because the master performers know how to do the job but they may not know the regs or the law inside and out. And we want to make sure that we're square with that. And I need to have managers and supervisors in that. Usually that's because my client wants them in there. You know, they want their management spies in to look at this, and make sure it's okay. And that's okay by me. I'm, I'm fine with that. As long as we know who they are and what their role is, they're mm-hmm. master performers necessarily. And maybe sometimes they are, um, and maybe they're not. And then, and then sometimes I like to have novice performers in that mix also because if all my master performers and subject matter experts, other subject matter experts, are, uh, you know, have been in the job for 20, 30 years, you know, they don't understand what it's like to be a new person coming in and climbing that learning curve at the very beginning of it. And so I need somebody to represent them so that they can, and I need somebody that's strong enough in that, that's a novice performer to say to the, you know, the old guard, hey, I'm sorry, you're wrong there. This is what you need to learn on day one. Now, you've been out on day one for 20 years here, but no kidding. I was just there and I'm representing those people. And usually there's more than one of them, but uh, so they can all chime in and agree with each other or just mm-hmm. as the case may be. But, uh, but so I need to get the right people. And, and that's what the whole project planning and kickoff involves in my approach to things. Then we slide into analysis with those right people. And we focus on, you know, what's the, what's the target audience? What do we know about them? What can we safely assume about them and not assume? What's the job? What are the outputs produced? What are the measures for those outputs? What are the tasks that go with those outputs? Because I'm very process performance oriented. And then I want to know what are the various roles and responsibilities? Because very few people are doing the job all by themselves. There's handoffs, there's collaboration. And so what, who's doing what? Who's on first base? Who's on second base, et cetera? Um, and so I want to understand that so I can convey that to the learner. This is the people in the in the in the play box of perform in the sandbox of performance. Here's who you're going to play with. And so this is what the job is to get those tasks performed to produce those outputs. And oh, by the way, what the master performers will tell you, here are the current state gaps of people who aren't master performers. There are barriers to performance. And what we want to do is tap into the wisdom of the master performers and how do they avoid the barriers in the first place? And if they were unavoidable, how do they recover as quickly as possible with the least damage? So that's our analysis. And then after we understand that, we go and look at what are the enabling knowledge and skills that are required? What do you need to know in order to be able to do? And then I, the fourth part of my analysis is always to go look at existing content that the shareholders have already invested in. Can I salvage that, use it as is, after modification, or not at all, and make conscious decisions about that? And then that leads to the next section of the book, which gets into design. And I have kind of a three layers to design. If you think of architectural blueprints, you know, the first one is, is the picture of the building or the campus or whatever, and you flip the page, and now you're into the details, and you flip another page, and all of a sudden you're looking at the electrical wiring diagrams. So I call my top level of a course an event, and learning is an event, it's usually a chain of events, and and formal and informal and social. Um, But so if I were to have an event and within a series of events, what's this event supposed to do given what came before and what's gonna come after? So we're not, you know, if we're gonna have redundancy, it should be by design and not inadvertent. 
and the, there's an event map of lessons, just like the map of the United States is of states. And so then there's a lesson map of what I call instructional activities, just like a state map might show you counties or whatever the term is for that in the state or commonwealth. Um, and then the instructional activities, there's three types. There's information that we need to provide people. There's demonstration that we might need to provide people. And then there's application, application exercises, practice with feedback generally, um, that you know help people, you know, memorize things because they've practiced it and gotten feedback or they've honed a couple of skills or something. And, you know, that's all if the job performance context demands a memorized response. If that performance context allows for a referenced performance response, we should get people job aids or performance support or whatever it's called and allow them to reference that in order to do the job. And if they do that often enough, they'll learn it. And if they do it only once a quarter, or once a year, they won't learn it. And they'll just refer back to that job aid. And so that's all part of the design thinking is that what are we doing? Are we handing out job aids at one point, not even going to cover them? Are we going to hand out job aids and cover them because it's tricky and we need to show people how to use that job aid and maybe where to find it? Or is this really, there's no time for job aids. They're going to have to know this on demand and they're going to have to know it well enough. And so that's what we're going to train on, drill and practice and all of that. So the, so the lesson mapping is a mapping of those information, demonstration, and applications. And that's what that section of the book gets into those three things. There's the three chapters on that. And after that, I you, you would go develop per your design and you would do what's sometimes called developmental testing. I create a first draft. I get it reviewed with some people. I create a second draft. I go review that with people. I call that alpha and beta testing. You can call it anything you want. And then that's all geared to getting ready to go to a full destructive pilot test where I'm going to take, if I've had different teams developing different pieces of my instruction, if you will, I'm going to pull all that together and deliver it like it's intended to be delivered in the real world. And I'm going to try to break it. And I involve two particular sets of target audiences, if you will, in the pilot test, on the pilot test team. I have target audience members, people who are really the intended target audience, and we can measure learning with them. We can see if they, you know, what they came in the door knowing with a pretest. We can see what they know going out with a post test. Uh, we can see how that transfers to the job if our pilot test extends out into the job and, and some time uh, applying it. But they, those people can't tell us whether what we taught them was accurate, complete, or appropriate. So well, we can measure learning, and it, sometimes it could be the wrong thing. There's a couple of good stories about that I won't go into. But um, so the other people, the other half of the target audience, if you will, for a pilot test is master performers and other subject matter experts, those people from the law department, regulatory affairs or whatever, safety engineers. Um, and we, we, we have them go through the training so they can feel the pain of the learning and decide whether or not what we taught was accurate and complete because things can be accurate but incomplete. And then we force people to learn informally or socially out on the jobs and maybe that's okay. And maybe that's okay in addition, but maybe we could have gone a little bit further and made it more complete. This is where cognitive task analysis gets into what's the thinking behind the decisions that people make as they're doing their jobs. Should we share that with them or should we let them figure that out when they get out? There? So, so that pilot test is really critical to do that full destructive test. And so that's, I've got a chapter on, you know, my approach to doing that, which you know, people will need to adapt rather than adopt most likely. And after that, you know, there's the revising the content and either repiloting or just releasing it to be used. And you put it out there in the systems that allow access or the systems that deploy it. Maybe instructors need to be trained and certified or coaches need to be trained and certified. And then that all leads to ongoing use of the content. And now you can do your evaluation and you can do continuous improvement. Or you can decide, okay, that fits that those are fits laws and regulations that no longer are are in uh, use, and so therefore we just take the content out and and archive it or can it or whatever you want to say and get it out of the mix. So that's that's what the book is intended to do: is to walk people through all the background of how the what the first chapter talks about, 
if you had to do it in kind of one meeting or a quick series of meetings to do this lesson mapping. As well. yeah. Sorry. And we'll get into the lesson mapping. So thanks, first of all, for that overview. And I love your, your conversational, you know, nonchalant, straight shooting approach, you know, to, to, to showcasing it. Um, the book is rich. And when I was reading it, um, the, you, you made some provocative statements that caught my eye. And I kind of want to dig into some of those. And I think that'll add a lot of context for people watching okay. and, and prep them for the book. So I'm going to paraphrase something you wrote early in the book. You said, that you believe the manner in how you've been doing instructional analysis, design, and development is equivalent to what is now being called design thinking in LD and agile in LD. You go on to say the key difference between the language and labels is that you have a, re a relentless focus on performance requirements of the learner's performance back on the job. Um, I want you to dig into that a little bit because I would think any instructional designer might be thinking that way, even with agile, even with design thinking. So if you can just ex expand on that for us. Yeah. So that perhaps was a bit of an overgeneralization, you know, um, but in truth, in the, you know, because of one of the things that I do in my instructional design projects, whether it's curriculum architecture or this more addy level, if you will, mm -hmm. is look at existing content to see what I can salvage, what I can use as is or after modification. And by and large, what the things that I can use, I can use as is if I bolt uh, bookends onto the thing on the front and the back and preface, you know, why you're going to learn this generic content because it's usually about topics and not about tasks. It, yeah. it teaches you topics and then for a variety of reasons, mostly that analysis wasn't conducted. We don't know what is the application of this topic. It's got mm -hmm. validity. Of course, everybody needs to know that. Of course. What do they do with it? How do they apply it in their jobs? That's the unknown. And too often, instructional content has been missing that since the late 70s, since mm -hmm. the 80s, probably before I got involved in this thing, because I've seen way too much of this and I just, it's a focus on topics and not on tasks and outputs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to know how to apply those topics. So the topics might be valid, might have performance validity, but don't go far enough. Right. And, and so, I, so that's my relentless focus on performance. I learned that from the late Gary Rumler, from many others, Joe Harless, Bob Mager. Um, but so I want to understand how these things apply to people's task performance, either their behavioral tasks or their cognitive tasks. They try to produce outputs that meet the stakeholder requirements. And that requires analysis of who the stakeholders are anyway. Are stakeholders are uh, focused on the output alone and they don't care about the tasks or do they care about the tasks and not the outputs or do they care about both? So that's a complicated thing that we really need to understand to help provide that kind of guidance to learners who are really performers. In mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the notion that, you know, a lot of the things that I've seen in turn, and I'm overgeneralizing here again, so that, you know, design thinking and agile thinking, a lot of use of teams, yeah. uh, 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 you know, having empathy for mm -hmm. the learners, or I would think I would, I'd want to have empathy for, all the stakeholders. Learners are but one of the stakeholders. And so, you know, learners have to learn how to do, number one for me is have empathy with the fact that a learner has got to learn how to be successful in performing tasks to produce outputs on the job. Otherwise, they may not have that job for very long. So let's, let's take them all the way to how this applies and then how this might need to vary out on your job because not, not everything is so rote. And so that's the first empathy the second is managers have jobs to do. They have mm -hmm. these people on their teams to do that. And executives have to, you know, take the shareholders' money, investments, equity, and, you know, get the business to happen to meet strategic goals and current day operational goals. And so that I got to have empathy for them. I've got to have empathy for what we're doing with the shareholders' money. Are we getting a sufficient return on investment? You know, are we investing money in instruction where we should have just let that go to be informal or to be social? Or we up the social thing by structuring OJT versus unstructured OJT. So right. there's, there's this continuum of, you know, informal to formal and social can be informal and social can be formal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the way I've been practicing these kinds of things. And so what I've seen from design thinking and agile is these are a lot of things that actually go back to 
uh, one of my favorite books is The Machine That Changed the World. And this is from 1990, and it was an MIT study about lean production in American auto manufacturing and in the Japanese auto manufacturing. And if those of you who are old enough will know that, you know, the Japanese were kicking American auto manufacturers <laughs> butts, so to speak. Yeah. Um, with their higher quality products. And so, you know, what do we do about that? I guess was what MIT was asking themselves. And so there's a lot of things that the Japanese were doing going back into the 1950s. They did quality circles because Deming brought them quality circles, the quality guru uh, Deming from Western Electric, AT&T uh, back in the 30s, I think. And, uh, but there's all these methods about how do we work with teams? How do we uh, facilitate communications, social learning across people working on a product team or whatever? Um, how do we organize that? How do we schedule and plan projects to get them done as quickly as possible with the highest quality without, you know, with less and less variation mm -hmm. in processes because that affects the variation in the final product. And so there's a lot of this thinking that's been around for decades, and we give it new names like design thinking. And, you know, so I, I don't not oppose to any of that. What I, what I don't, what I'm not happy about is that a lot of these things that we're trying in the past have lessons learned. Here's where they work. Here's where they don't work. It's yeah. simple. You know, and so you don't want to try your design thinking on something that's critical. Life is at stake. Huge fines to the company. And you could bankrupt your company if you do this wrong and you need to not maybe go so quick. You maybe have to have the appropriate reviews and that you can call that the testing part of design thinking, you know, prototype something and test it. You know, that's what I do when I create my alpha and beta version mm -hmm. of content and go in for a full destructive test. Mm -hmm. I had the executives in charge of labor relations in the back of the room, not, not willing to participate as a, as a learner, but he was going to sit there and judge what we were doing and what we were teaching and make a decision as to whether or not he was going to accept it or reject it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's, there's many ways to get this testing done. Of course, the acid test for me is, does it go back out to the job and, and improve people's performance? That's it. That's it. We can improve it, but it can still not actually work. And that may be because we didn't uncover some of the resistance we might have from supervisors or peers that the person mm -hmm. can do. And so one of the things I've learned to talk about, and I think I talked about it in this book a little bit, is I bring up transfer. You know, how are we going to affect transfer? What do we think is going to stop transfer from happening? I bring that up in my first meeting with my clients before we've even done analysis. And I've had a lot of them say, you know, you bugged the hell out of us with all this stuff about transfer. And it wasn't until we got to the end of the pilot test that I started thinking, oh, yeah, that transfer is going to be tricky because people are going to resist this yeah. change. And so what are we, the managers, the stakeholders going to do about that? Because the training isn't going to change everybody else's minds. So there needs to be communications and rewards and recognition and, and things to extinguish bad behavior, the old behavior, if you will, in order to move the organization to some new yeah. set of processes and behaviors, et cetera, that will encourage, you know, what, what the goal of the instruction was and what the goals of the company are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry, another long answer. I no, 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 it's solid. And, and, you know, there's other things that you mentioned in the book, and some of the, but before I before I get into to those areas, I don't want to lose the focus of the book. It's on it's on this idea of the lesson mapping. And uh, when I was looking at the manuscript, I was like, "Wow, this reminds me of a business canvas in, in a lot of ways." And so, and, and I, there's tools like this out there. So I guess I want to I want to uh, have you take a moment and explain, you know, how this is this tool is going to help instructional designers and in, and in, in their particular processes. Sure. I, so I think part of you know, so there's a format for mm -hmm. a lesson map, and it's a fairly standard thing, and I've. You know, when I first did this on my first project in 1990, I changed it shortly after that because it, the first format was geared towards instructor-led training. You know, it said lecture instead of, you know, information. And so, I, so the information, demonstration, and application, we tell them, we show them, and then we make them show us that they got it. You know, we give them feedback and have a, sec, a succession of practice with feedback sessions generally is my preference. There's all sorts of different ways to, you know, practice applying what you have learned. 
But so the format is used in a backward chaining, backward design, if you will. And I know this is a term that's come up more recently, but back in the 80s, we talked about backward chaining our content. And so in the lesson map, at the very top of it, you give it a temporary title so that everybody knows, okay, that's kind of what this is about. We're not going to wordsmith that. We're going to, we'll fix all that later at the very end. Yeah. We'll put a temporary title. And then I have two questions to help establish what are the objectives of this? I have performance objectives and I have learning objectives. My goal is to affect performance and learning is the means to that since we talked about, you know, lesson mapping. And, but people are thinking about what people need to learn. So I, sometimes I go, okay, what do they need to learn? And we write that down and I will do a face polling around the room to make sure everybody's okay with us. Mm -hmm. We've captured or they want to modify it and we do that. And then I can flip it to, okay, so terminally, what is it that we want to happen out on the job? What's the performance objective? We want them to learn this, but what for what reason? Can we write it down just to keep us focused on that's what this is all about? Be able to do this by learning this. Okay, so that's the first thing is to establish that. Again, it's rough language. You don't worry about, you know, fine tuning it or making it pretty or or grammatically correct. You know, you just get something up there so that that's the focus of this chunk. And there may be other chunks that we're going to worry about come before and after this or whatever. Um, and then, so then I start with, all right, if that's the performance objectives and that's the learning objectives, I go to my, the column on the far right, there's three columns, information, demonstration, and application. Info, demo, apo. Mm -hmm. What are the, what's the final apo that we would put on here? And I go to the bottom of the right-hand corner of the page and I make a little box. I say, so what's the final test look like where we're going to have Guy the learner do something and then we're going to be able to assess whether he did it correctly and produce something of that. So what would that look like? So we know what the performance is that we're kind of focused on. So it's really kind of either doing real work or simulated real work. You know, we could use last week's real work that somebody already did and the answer's already done and it's already been, you know, happened. We can take that and make that an exercise. Can Guy do this real work from last week that's already been done? Or do we need to simulate it because doing the real work would just take way too long and there's a lot of stuff in there that's not really the critical pieces. So we're going to simulate just the critical aspects of this. So what the final test would be. Now, testing has all been a huge issue in here. And so a lot of people don't like the testing thing. So to me, it's just, oh, it's just the final practice with feedback. It's practice. And so whatever language my clients want, because some of them want testing, some of them don't. So you know, yeah. that's how you adapt this. So what? So if that's the final test, then I introduce this concept of four levels of practice with feedback. There's the easy peasy, you know, it just tells people this is what the exercise is. It's easy. It's not really stressful or anything like that. It get, It's like dipping your toe into the water. Then you go in knee deep. Uh, then we do something that's difficult. And then we do something maybe after the difficult exercise, we do a darn difficult one or use your whatever words you want. And then I've got the final level of application exercises, which is from Hades or from hell. And so this is everything that you're going to have to know how to do out on the job. Mm -hmm. I have an exercise where there's four levels back to back to back, or we interleave them and do whatever. Um, but we can get people to where they can actually handle a tougher situation, whatever the performance actually is, performing tasks to produce outputs. Then the question is, so if those are the practice with feedback that we need, and we may have four levels, we may only have one or two. Um, do we do a demonstration? Do we show the learner what it is that's in that application exercise? Do we demonstrated for them before the application exercises? And yes or no is the answer. If the audiences are a bunch of incumbent performers, then they already know what this looks like. And so we don't need to demonstrate for them because they already know. But if there's a mix of them in there that are new to the job, then they may never have seen this part of the performance. And so therefore it behooves us to show them a demonstration of it before they do the application exercises. And I like slow, mo, dem, mo's. The hand is quicker than the eye, so we often need to slow things down and point things out to people so that they can observe this in a more controlled way. We may show it them normal speed and slow it way down, stop it, talk about it, start it up again, show them again at regular speed, just like you know, watching uh, re instant replay in a football game. What happened? We can see what happened if we slow it down. 
Mm -hmm. And people are more prepared now to go into that application exercise. So all that data comes from what I call the performance model, where I've captured the outputs and the tasks, the roles and responsibilities, and the gap performance. And so that data informs, that analysis data informs this part of the design, the objectives and the application exercises and the demonstrations. Then I have all this enabling knowledge and skill data from my analysis efforts. And so I use that to inform the information column. So what information do you need to know this law and this regulation and this code? Do you need to know about this company policy and procedure? Do you need to know about this software? Do you need to use these three interpersonal skills to do that? And so what's the skinniest amount, the minimum uh, viable product, if you will, for information to prepare people for that demonstration, to get them ready to go into the application? And how, and, and when guys facilitating groups of people, we say, and usually the people I'm working with, they don't want long, drawn out information. Mm -hmm. That, 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 let's watch it. Okay, now let's go do it and, and give some feedback and do it again based on that feedback. And so the information leads to the demonstration, leads to the application exercises. And I can now cut out maybe what a subject matter expert may have wanted to put in the course, a long, drawn out war story or you know, going into depth and, and all this, you know, things that don't happen very often happen once in a blue moon. And they want to tell people about that too. If you don't need that to make sense of the demonstration, it doesn't make it to the information column. Mm -hmm. And so I can skinny down and remove as much extraneous content. And you're never perfect about this. So there's some of that that sneaks in and you may have things that are missing. So it's not, it's accurate, but incomplete, you know, which is the, the completeness issue is, is the big bugaboo, I think, for all of us that are doing this. So I can skinny down the information, decide what sequence it needs to be, do the laws come first, and then the company policy and procedure, and then the software tools, and then the interpersonal skills. And how do I keep that as short as possible and relevant to the performance that's coming up so that I can demonstrate this is what it looks like it's all together. Let's go do the application exercise you know, one, two, three, or maybe even four of them to really hone a skill. You know, if I'm going to learn how to weld, I'm going to weld something more than once and, you know, to prove that I can do it. And it gets trickier and more complex each time. And maybe I'm doing info demo, Apple of the easy peasy, more information, more demonstration, a thing that's a little bit more difficult. And then, Here's all this other stuff, all these variations that can happen. Here's a demonstration of the world gone, you know, set on fire. And now your application exercises, your situation is on fire mm -hmm. with that. Um, but if that's what we need to prepare the learner for, and not all learners have to come out ready to take the wheel of a jet aircraft with 280 people on it. Um, but which if you were, then you need to know everything and really be fully trained and be fully competent on the job before you take the wheel. But most of the time, we can put people out there and expect them to learn additionally on the job. Mm -hmm. in formal means, uh, trial and error, or by social means, working with their peers, mm -hmm. or with their suppliers and customers, you know, whatever that situation is, we can hope that the learning gets extended there. And we can provide space learning in addition to that to refresh things that the job may not reinforce you know, day in, day out once you get out there maybe something that doesn't come up very often and we need you to be at the ready for that so we can plan the space learning using a similar kind of mechanism, the information demonstration and application, or maybe it's just application. Here's quizzes that we send out to you every two or three weeks, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. the sequence and schedule needs to be. So- Go ahead, yeah, finish No, 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 that, so that's, you know, so that's, uh, that's, really what the what that's all about the lesson mapping itself mm -hmm. and, and kind of a little bit about the data and, and what how the data informs all of that right and and the decisions of what goes in what 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 does not and i think yeah i think that anybody who's listening to this and watching us talk about it is when they do get the book uh you've done a fabulous job in there with the illustrations because i think then when they see the illustrations in the book it's going to make very clear. I think it's a, it's a very much a visual process. And I think that's a, a strong uh, component. Yeah. That, so that the, the business canvas, there's, you know, so I, I, a lot of these ideas I got from what was called the blue sheet. I forget which sales vendor had this, but it was hmm. sales teams would get together, huddle around a, a, a flip chart easel that had, you know, two flip chart easels that had this big uh, uh, 
you know, double wide flip chart page, if you will, with all the cells on it. This is what do we know about this account? Who are the decision makers? Who are the influencers? What's their buying process? And the sales team would get together and fill this thing in and then decide, okay, so what's our next step? Where are we missing data? We need to go find out this data here before we can formulate our actual sales strategy for this account. Um, and so, you know, I've seen I've seen a lot of these kinds of things. They're, they're job aids, if you will. And they so are. It's, yeah. it's really just a job aid to give focus when you're, if you're facilitating. So it's really all about the data. So if I'm facilitating a group of people, the right people, it gives us a visual focus. We can put this in here. They can challenge. They go, what, guy, what do you mean by that word? I'm not sure I like that word. I, I use a different word. Okay. We can we can figure all that out and, and get that. Uh, dis- mm-hmm. But if I'm doing this by myself and going and doing a bunch of interviews and then reviews, I still use this format to capture the data because the data is the data, regardless of how I generate it, regardless of how I review it and and try to you know inspect the build the quality in inspect the quality into it so that it's uh, accurate, complete, and appropriate. And so that's so there's not really a lot of secret to that. And so if you didn't like lesson mapping, you call it something else. I mean, sure. who cares? It's just about the data. And if you call the data field the little cell something else, who cares? It's not about that. It's about you know helping people learn how to perform, and that's what I attempted to do with this lesson map. Yeah. And, it, and like you, ju- and you just, you said it again, well, you said it early on about adapting, right? So somebody would take this and adapt it to the circumstances. And I want to get into that a little bit because, um, and this is where it gets kind of like in the meat of it. You've had a long career. You've had, you've had many clients and I think we can, we can tease out some, st- some war stories from you here through these that might help people a little bit because what you're talking about with the, with the lesson mapping is it is a planning exercise. It's a, it's a, it's a process. And like I said, it's a visual tool, but it will guide a conversation and, and make sure that everything and all the holes and buckets are filled. But you do say, I think it was in chapter three, um, the importance of planning is cultural. So this is planning. This this lesson lesson mapping is planning, of course. So, but how do you tease this out? Because what you're implying there is being cultural is like, well, it's important in some organizations, and other organizations are probably it's not important. So I'm I'm curious from your experience, uh, if it's not deemed to be important, uh, how do you ensure that the project's going to be successful? So so uh, so there's there are cultures that are just do it. We yeah. don't and we just do it. And, but, but guy as a consultant can go bankrupt if I incur costs to get it done right beyond what I've charged you yeah. in the first place. Now, one of the things about my practice is that I got burned so many times by vendors when I was at Motorola in 81 and 82 that I promised myself I would never do a change order on a client's project. Mm. I don't. And, and 80% of my projects are fixed fee because clients love that. It's going to cause that no matter what, guy, no matter what, you know. Yeah. So it behooves me that I've done a really a darn good job of planning my projects and detailing that in a plan. That plan becomes part of the contract. So the customer just doesn't give me money and I give them some training. They give me the right people at the right time and all that's spelled out in gl- Got it. gory detail. Yeah. Um, and some clients of mine, when they've looked at this, they go, okay, but we can't show this to the project steering team. And I understand that, that you want to show this to the project steering team. And God, that's not our culture. We don't, we don't plan in detail. We just do it. And I go, okay, well, uh, and they say, you can't show them your 30 page project plan. And most of those are charts of all the various tasks. It's like a reverse task analysis. Here's what we're going to do. Who's going to do it when, when we're going to hit certain milestone dates, not every task is scheduled, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I might have a 30 page and they say, you know, you can show them two pages at most. So I'll do a two page version of that project plan. And, and this happens so often, not every time, but so often I'll show them the, cl- the project steering team in a formal meeting because they're going to, approve the funding for this, you know, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and they're looking at this and they're going, okay, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, because managers are on the payroll to uh, prod and poke and challenge. And so they would look at this two pages and they go, hey, how, what do you, where did this number come from? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In the meeting, pull out the 30 page project plan, hand them the copy because I brought more than one and give it to them and say, on page 17, you'll see that there are 17 tasks that need to be done. And that's where that number comes from. 
right right look at it okay then just i just wanted to make sure that you know we, <laughs> that we were thoughtful about what we we're doing and how we were doing it mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you know a lot of plans are not very good but they may be very detailed and so how do you you protect yourself by doing a detailed plan if the client only wants to see a briefing of that plan fine yeah. show them the briefing but have that as a backup in your back pocket, so to speak, so that you can show them the detail. Um, I first wrote an article on detailed project planning for the Chicago chapter of NSPI, which is now ISPI, way back in 1986. And I learned this from my business partner, the late Ray Svensson, who was a Bell Labs engineer, who was about strategic planning for AT&T at their corporate headquarters, and then went to the training organizations. And so he was all about detailed planning. I loved it when I first saw his detailed plans because um, that's just how my head works. Right, and I right. understand, you know, what's around the corner, you know, can we ask questions? Can we figure that out and how we're going to handle that? What are the various things that we might see? And is our plan robust to the unknown? So there's always this, you know, understanding what's the touch time to do that. So then what's the cycle time you allow that to happen? Well, that's, if that's three days of touch time, Maybe I better give it four or five days in which to happen. So there's some wiggle room. And, and then what are the key things that need to be hard scheduled and everything else can be soft scheduled? Guy will do those three days sometime in that week, but we don't know what days of the week it's going to be. But he's got to be ready for that steering project steering team meeting on the following Friday. And so that there are hard scheduled things and there are soft scheduled things. And it's all about, you know, what's what are the, and if you've done enough of this you can anticipate what's going to happen. But, but part of my thing is that it's a contract. It's part of the contract. So the client must give me that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've never asked for a change order, never needed to. If I've had, and I tell my clients, you know, I, this is my philosophy. And if I can't figure it out, then I'm not going to do it fixed. I'm going to do it time and expense. And then that's your, the ball's in your court. And you can decide mm -hmm. if you want to go ahead and do this. But I've had clients tell me, this is too hairy. We don't know what's going to happen. I'm not going to allow you to submit this uh, time uh, fixed fee. You're going to have to submit this time and expense because we are pretty darn sure that we're going to have a little blow up here, a little blow up there. And, you know, we, who knows what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's often happens when your instructional design project is part of a larger initiative where they're going to reinvent the world or reinvent some function or processes or something. And there's a lot of trial and error testing going on. Right. And you're going to be the tail on the dog. You're going to get wagged and not you're not going to, it's not going to be the reverse. So you're going to have to go with that flow and tie in your Addy like model or whatever you use to their planning milestones and see how yours fits in with theirs and where the big ahas of discovery of a brand new process might occur. And therefore, then all bets are off and you might have to change, you know, a lot or a little depending on what happens there. So when you're trying to come to the market, if you will, with a new process and new software and new training all at the same time and working in parallel, that's a different animal. And so that's it's harder to do a kind of a fixed fee approach to these kinds of things when you mm -hmm. that you can't or that you can trust that the other work streams are going to have issues and that you're going to have to you know, flex with that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just harder to do. Now, if clients have said, yeah, but we like the fixed fee idea. We want you to do that anyway. I go, okay, so then I just add a, I figure out all my incurred costs and then I add a bigger number on, you know, a uh, fudging factor, if you will. And they, maybe it's not 15%, maybe it's 20 or 25%. And I go, that's the fixed fee if I feel like I can really do that. So mm -hmm. planning is critical, I think to me, but you got to appreciate the culture and what you're dealing with. But that doesn't mean that you don't do the detail planning. Right. Even if they don't want you to or they don't want to see it right right good advice no that's really that's really solid and good experience from you too it's you know it leads me to another question you know i found in the book too and and um you know how how clients can you put it this way balk at doing analysis i mean most instructional designers that i know who were successful ones would almost argue you know about 60 percent of your time you should be used in the upfront analysis to get everything right. And to have a client who would be like, nope, let's get going. Like you said, just do it. Yeah. So from your experience, Guy, you know, unless the why is that, I understand the why, uh, but, but how do you overcome it? You're going to need that. 
I have to tell you a little story. This is from 1981 at Motorola. I got 30 manufacturing managers in the room. They are my client. And they're hitting me with, with their request. Mm -hmm. So I did my best active listing so that they knew that I heard them and what their issues were and everything, you know? So, um, and then I said, so here's where we're going to start. We're going to do some analysis. And the head guy stopped me and said, guy, we hate it when people like you come back to us 90 days later and tell us what we told you on day one. Mm -hmm. So this guy had been burned by analysis from the training organizations in the past, and he wasn't about to let that happen again. Right. So I said, I didn't have the lesson mapping thing going, but I knew what the data was because it's all still about the same data that I've always been collecting. It was just, you know, it didn't have a visual format for me to use. So I started asking him and the 29 other people in the room the questions that I use in analysis, which are, so what are... What, what, how do you frame the processes with, with the scope of what you're talking about? What are the various work streams or processes or whatever language is appropriate? And then, so what are the outputs at the end of that work stream? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks performed? Are there any interim outputs like a draft analysis report and a final analysis report? And then that process leads to design, you know, the equivalent. And so I started asking them all these questions and about, you know, so who, who's involved? Who else is involved in this besides your, it was for supervisors and manufacturing. And so who are the other players? What are the typical performance gaps and all this stuff? And it was not too far into that where I exhausted their knowledge. They had been manufacturing supervisors 20 years earlier. They didn't have a clue about what was going on today. And they realized that in the moment. And so I was able to say, well, that's the analysis data I need. And I will come back to your next meeting 30 days from now mm -hmm. with my analysis data for you to look at, approve, or modify before I use it in my design effort. Right. So I was being gated by their monthly meetings. So they go from one site to the next. And, yeah. you know, that. and so, but so it's really all about the data. And, and so one of the things that I learned a long time ago was not to do all of the analysis up front. So when I'm doing my project planning and kickoff phase, I'm starting my analysis then. When I go into my analysis phase, I'm doing a certain amount of analysis then because that's what the phase is all about. When I'm in design, I'm doing additional analysis. Right. When I'm mapping a lesson, somebody will say, you know, there's a piece of information missing here. It's not in our analysis data from the last phase here, but this is missing and that's missing. Okay. Where does it go? Before or after? Or where does it go into the flow? And we capture it. So we're doing additional analysis while we do design. And then when we're doing development, this is where we go deep. So I got these tasks, but there's many subtasks or steps or whatever you call them underneath that. And so I'm doing additional analysis. In, in so One of the things I learned from the quality movement, there was a saying back in the early 80s, we don't boil the ocean for a cup of tea. So we don't need to do all this analysis, which then feels like analysis paralysis up front where somebody is getting every last thing that they could ever maybe need to use. Guy would defer that until when I needed just in time and defer all those things all the way into the development phase um, and trust my process that if I got my analysis that frame things correctly, if I did the knowledge and skills, if I did the design and added a little bit more to it, then in doing analysis and design and doing analysis and development. When I go to pilot test, I'm actually going to be doing more analysis. Yeah. Did I yeah. get it accurate, complete, and appropriate? Yes or no? And, and so what's missing and how do we fix it? So the 60% is spread out throughout an addy like framework, if you will, mm -hmm. which is just a project planning framework, by the way, so no one gets mistakes. Right. The design methodology, it's not. It's just a project planning framework. Um, and so, but that's, you know, that's, I think, is, is critical. So the whole issue of um, doing analysis and, and, and getting that done and working with people, um, you, you have, they have to see the logic in your analysis. Now, back in the day, in the early 80s, you go to conferences and chapter meetings and see people's analysis data. It was like random lists of things. Mm -hmm. And I think what differentiated my approach to this, which I basically got from Gary Rumler's approach to this, was what's the output? Forget the tasks and knowledge and skills for now. What's the output? When they, when they go home at the end of the day, what's left on their desk? What's there on the factory floor? 
And, and how do we know a good one from a bad one and get some clarity around that? Then we can ask about the tasks that lead to that output. And so it's got a very, what, what you know, Tom Gilbert used to talk about, beware the cult of behaviors. Too many, too many times we trainers are into behaviors or knowledge or skills without understanding what's the output that's produced. Right. And we can talk about outcomes is when the output is used by the downstream customer and they get some benefit out of it. That's their outcome. But before we gave it to them, what was it? And what are the earmarks of it being a worthy output? Um, he called it accomplishments in the whole nine yards of the thing. But, but so I think that that's, that's really critical is that clients have to see more than what they traditionally see out of analysis. They need to see that and it needs to resonate with them. They need to go, yeah, that's what we produce. That's yeah. how we produce it. Yeah. That's what you got to know to be able to, oh, now it makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. But they're technical engineering types. They love this kind of stuff. Other people, other function or finance people like it too, but other functions, eh, it's too detailed. <laughs> a lot of people don't like that. <laughs> So what I hear a little bit from you too is that in a lot of ways you're you're open to analysis and information and data at every phase of the process, yeah. and just you have making to be. sure that yeah you have to you have to make sure that's very clear because uh, it it'll it'll influence the design and it might not bubble up until much later in the process when it, it couldn't have early on. Right, so. and some things get carved out. You know, I've had clients yeah. say, "Hey, you got A, B, C, D there, but we don't want B and C. Skip that." We want you to focus on A and D and E. And if I'd gone deep on that analysis, it would have all been for naught, wasted effort, wasted shareholder effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I can focus on the things that are really critical to the client once they can see it. And now we can focus on those other things. Maybe B and C could have been left to informal means to learn it. Oh, they'll learn that easy enough out of the job. We don't need to spend time doing that here. And so that's a legitimate you know, not everything that's uncovered by an instructional designer type or a learning experience designer is being addressed. It just doesn't from a business perspective. You know, too often we try to do everything and we should really have more of a focus on those things that are really, truly critical, that have right. high stakes, high rewards, high risks associated with them. And we can let the last the rest of it go because people can learn informally and socially, as you well know. And you know, we don't have to take on every last thing because that's no. a possible task. And some things are so volatile that it's best learned more informally or socially. And when that is in constant change and flux, the people will learn it as, as it changes. That's right. Keep up with that stuff with our formal content. That's right. That's right. Yeah, there's a place for it all. And I think, you know, like you like you just said, and, and much better than I could, it's like, I, I think when we, we get social and informal right in an organization, it improves training, right? And, you know, we, you know, we don't have to focus over there and, and, and obviously impact performance negatively by pulling people from the workflow. Let's focus over here on those things with high risk and, and reward. Um, and, and one of the things we can lend to that is that when we're doing our analysis, we can help our clients make the decisions about, yeah. well, that can be learned informally or socially. Then we can ask them, so how's that going to happen? Have yeah. you the infrastructure, the policies, the procedures, the, the tools in place to make that happen? Or That's is that right. a pipe dream? So the guy likes to be declarative and challenge his clients. And by this point in a project, they know that I, that's me. And so I'll say that to them. So because I've had many people during, when I'm doing analysis tell me, if only we got we could get our all, all 1,100 of us together in a room once a year to share best practices, what works, what doesn't, yeah. to be aware of, and all of that stuff, and talk to each other. And I've actually had clients set that up after we've done a big curriculum architecture project, because that's what the people were voicing would help them, because they want to learn from each other, those people who have been there and done that. And some instructor in the room may have an instructor's guide, and that's as close as they ever got to the real world. So they don't know. Not that that's not still a valuable way yeah. to go at times. But too often, what they talk about is not authentic. It's not real. It's not last week, this happened to me in a sales call or dealing mm -hmm. with a customer. And, and so we need to help people. We need to provide the infrastructure, for lack of a better word, that enables people to actually have those kinds of conversations, to have the directory to know, hey, there's people in other parts of the business that do the same thing I do. 
yep. in a different department with a different job title, but they're still doing those kinds of things here. Can I tap into the wisdom of them? Can we share, you know, and, and you don't have to necessarily orchestrate all of that because you want it to be more organic. And I think that you talk a lot about that, but, but so, but, but have we made it more difficult for people to do that? That's right. Punishing for them to do that. Hey, guy, get back to work and don't be talking to that person, whoever you're talking to, for whatever reason you think is valuable. I, I don't, you know, so we need to have more of a mindset about this is a part of it um, and that there's infrastructure and things to put in place. Formal learning has its place, but social learning has its place in the continuum from, you know, informal social learning to formal social learning. And, and in formal learning, the things are going to happen by trial and error, by hook mm -hmm. and crook or whatever. That can happen too. So where do we, you know, where do we put our strategically place our bets? How do, right. we do this? And so that we can help our, our clients and our leaders understand that entire mix. Mm -hmm. Not be just a one trick pony. Yep. Well put. Sounds like you read somebody's book. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I did read your book. <laughs> Guy, this has been great. Uh, you've definitely got a lot of detail uh, you shared today. So I want to kind of wrap up by asking uh, you uh, to tell our audience here um, where they can find out more information about performance-based lesson mapping and the book, of course, I mean, and instructional development using a facilitated group process. Um, when will it be available and in what formats? Well, I'm, I've got this out to 11 people who are doing a review, 11 besides you. And they are feedback is due at the end of August 2021. Okay. So I hope to have the book, depending on the amount of feet. Uh, you know, I always like this to be close to 90, 95% done. And I usually find out it's more like 80 or less. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I'm not sure how much uh, updating I'll need to do. But my goal is that by the end of September, for sure, I should have the book available. It'll be available uh, via Amazon as a Kindle and as a paperback. Um, and, uh, you know, that's it. And so it should come out. This is my 17th book since 94. Most of them have been on instructional systems design or what mm -hmm. is known as a learning experience design. And uh, other as other books are, are more about uh, performance improvement or like a total quality management approach to, to re-engineering processes and things like that, because I think they all go together. So uh, as we close out, um... I've been following you. Where where would people find you today as you share your, your wisdom and insights? Well, I am on both Twitter and LinkedIn, and uh, they can figure all that out and figure out my email and all that. Uh, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes, of course, but uh, and through my website, which is uh, www.epic with two P's, E P I C dot B I Z, epic dot biz. So you can find me there and uh, I have oodles of resources for free, free books, lots of articles. Uh, I think I have over 600 videos on my YouTube site. So you can find, you know, your way to that. Yeah. If you dare. If you dare to, to yeah. wade in the waters of, of Guy yeah. Wallace. <laughs> Guy, thanks so much. I really appreciate one. I appreciate you letting me flip the tables and grill you a little bit about some of your ideas. The book uh, looks fantastic. And um, so I appreciate having the opportunity to look at it in advance and uh, do stay in touch. Thank you, Mark.